Hello YouTube, how are we all doing? Alex Karen here from Echo Alpha and also from Depict. And we are gonna to talk today about the Zenmuse X5R. And specifically, we're gonna look at the workflow involved with getting the fantastic raw images from this camera, from the SSD card, and working with them in the most efficient manner possible, but also at the same time, trying to keep hold of as much detail as we possibly can. So obviously those familiar, the DJI Zenmuse X5R is a camera gimbal um, set up where you can either mount it from uh, an aerial platform like the Inspire One Pro, or even turn it around and mount it on the Osmo uh, Pro, or the Osmo Raw, I should say. So it's a very, very good camera. It shoots in 4K and it shoots Cinema DNG 12-bit RAW. It's interesting actually because it says 12-bit there, but when we bring it into the program we're going to be working with it later, it actually says 16-bit. So a um, little bit of confusion there, but regardless, there's an incredible amount of detail and a very, very high bit rate when you shoot RAW. The very clever thing about the Zenmuse X5R is it also has a micro SD card that slots in and it records H.264 proxies, which are very, very helpful for working with very quickly and there's still an incredible amount of detail, still an incredible amount of dynamic range in these images, but you just don't have the flexibility that the raw DNG sequences give you. So that's a little bit of an overview and let's get straight into workflow. So there are a few different workflows kicking about, but the first thing that you will have to do with your X5R when you've done some shooting and you've got a lovely SSD card full of all of this information, you will have to download and use a program that DJI have called CineLite. It's available on their download page. So if we go to the download page and down to the bottom, you'll see software and drivers DJI CineLite and then you'll download that. I've already done that on this computer, so there's no need to do it. But essentially, the DJI CineLite application allows you to access those uh, raw images from your hard drive. When you actually mount the hard drive, it will pop up here on the right-hand side, and you'll see it's a DJI drive. If you double-click on it, very, when you very first get it, you'll see that actually DJI CineLite is on the drive, and um, that's how you can actually install it. But obviously, if you want the most up-to-date version, do check out the downloads page. And uh, once you've got CineLite installed, you'll actually be able to access your, your footage because on the drive itself, there's actually nothing at all other than uh, the, the, the CineLite files. That's pretty much it. You can't actually see any footage of any sort by just clicking on the drive. A lot of people have said this is a bit of a pain because it does add this big step to your workflow, but unfortunately, that's the way it is. So we fire up DJI CineLite and this is the application you're greeted with. If you have your SSD drive already attached and mounted on your computer, you'll see it will pop up here and all the clips that you've shot will appear in this left-hand side over here. You'll be able to then browse through, do a little bit of correction and stuff over here if you want to. My personal advice would be to not bother. Uh, the actual preview window that you get is very, very poor quality and even hitting play, you never, you can't even get close to playing back in, in, in normal time. So it's just not worth even bothering. Uh, this is purely from my point of view an offload step. So you simply select the clips that you want, um, in which case, you know, all of them, you press the little button, button down here, I'm just gonna get rid of the dock and you click export. Uh, a little dialog will pop up and ask you where you want to put these sequences. So normally I suggest putting them on a fast media drive because that's where you're gonna be accessing them from later and make sure you name them in a raw folder, you know where you're, you're, you're putting them. There are a few options in terms of format. You can go straight out to Apple ProRes, which is a, a fine format if you wanna kinda of just get cracking straight away. Um, Personally, I think if you're gonna work with raw files, you want to go to a DNG sequence. That's really the top option, the default option, because it just gives you the maximum scope for really getting the most from your raw files. And that said, there's also a DNG sequence compatible with Premiere Pro option, which is a second option down, I believe, when you click in. And by doing that, you'll again have the option to have a, a format that's much, much more friendly in your NLE, particularly Premiere Pro, but also in DaVinci Resolve, which is the way we're going to produce this, this workflow, which certainly I found to be one of the best um, for, for working with this type of footage. The annoying thing is the DNG sequence that is compatible with Premiere Pro as opposed to a normal DNG sequence, it's bigger in size, so it's a little bit more taxing on your storage, so do be aware that you're gonna need some some serious storage. Um, we found that we record about 512 gig, which is obviously your, your, your capacity on your SSD, and that will turn into about a terabyte of footage by the time you're finished with it. So 
lots of storage is required if you're going to work with this uh, the other way of course is just to be super efficient when you're shooting and make sure you only shoot the takes that you need okay so once you're in cine light you'll start that process off this is a great time to go and get a cup of coffee because it takes a long while you're not going to be unloading your cards quickly this way and uh, it's it just takes an awfully long time we, we had a whole card and it took about three hours to offload the footage so it's a, a very time consuming and it's a a bit of a pain but this is the beauty about the workflow that I'm now discussing because there in one of the main other workflows I've seen it involves going in and doing some more processing in another application and from my point of view that just is another step another time-consuming step that we just don't need to do so very quickly just looking at those workflows um, essentially what will happen once you finish with City Light if I just find one here's a shoot that we did for Blenheim Palace so there's my HD64 proxies that come straight off the camera. Absolutely nothing wrong with them at all. They look really nice. As you can see, that's Blenheim Palace. Looks fantastic. And we were just composing our shot there. Looks really nice. Nothing wrong. You could absolutely work with that. But again, the raw file just gives us a little bit more scope. These are our raw files, freshly out of CineLite. So you can see it numbers them up for you, puts them in specific folders, and there are all of our individual DNG images. So. Fantastic, ready to work. But as you can see, the difference in size, H.264, 10.56 gig. Here are the raw files. Ooh, 586 gig. Uh, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, footage there for to be working with. It's just crazy. It blows my mind every time I see it. Anyway, so we're going to start working with these. And just like any other raw file, any other raw still file, you can come in here, open up with Photoshop, take it into camera raw, start tweaking it, and you're gonna get a really good flexibility and versatility with that frame. You're gonna be able to do all sorts, of recover highlights, move up shadow detail, uh, change white balance colors, do a lot, really, really do a lot with it. Trouble is, you have to do it with all of these, and I think this actual clip is 59 seconds long, but you'll see that actually it actually becomes 1,492 uh, still frame so that's an awful lot to be doing by yourself so you definitely don't want to be individually doing them you could batch process them but again i've found that to take an incredibly long time so a couple of workflows one is to take it straight into premiere pro uh, i'm not going to do that now i'm just going to discuss it very quickly uh, premiere pro will edit dng sequences it will do it very very well you have to bring them in through the media browser you can throw them onto your timeline and you pretty much can start working with them right away i found that there's some necessary tweaks. You have to turn your scopes to see HDR, and then you have to make sure that in your limitry panel, panel on the left-hand side, sorry, right-hand side of the frame, that that's turned over to HDR as well. And you do then get some opportunities to start moving the HDR image around, but it's just a little clunky still. And having spoken to someone high up at Adobe, they're working on it. It's very much an early implementation of the, of the technology, and they're working on it, and they're trying to get a much, much more sturdy workflow uh, and that will be something that comes out quite soon um, it's a little bit clunky though so for me still it's not the very best way to go for it although i'm a massive fan of premiere pro and it's one of my, my main editors um, so that's one option the other option that i've seen people is once they've come out of cine light and they've got all their dng sequences ready to go is they are taking them into after effects and once they get into after effects they are opening up the dng sequence and to import it and what that will then do is open up camera raw and give you the opportunity to edit that very first dng sequence or the dng frame so you get to edit the first frame and then what that program does is it actually applies those corrections to the entire clip which is fine because you then once you've done that essentially you export from you can trim and export within after effects although i've again i'm, I'm on a very quick system here and i found that just trying to trim or play through the shot to get an idea of what's actually happening within the shot so you know where i need to trim the, the the in and the outs whether i want to cut halfway through it's just too clunky it takes far far too long even if you you resolution down to say a quarter of the resolution it still just takes too long and it's very hard to, to work with uh, and then essentially what you would do is export those out to a high quality prores or a high quality dnx hd if you're a windows user and then you'd be able to bring those into your, your editor of choice and play with them and you do retain a lot of the information in the raw file um, I think someone said online about 90%, uh, you, you know, you retain, and so you still have some flexibility to move it around in your NLE in terms of recovery highlights, lifting shadows, etc. But for me, that's still a very clunky workflow. So 
The way I prefer to do it and the way I've found to be the best so far is to use DaVinci Resolve. So we're gonna give you a quick idea of how that works. Currently, I'm afraid Final Cut doesn't really have an option. So if you're in Final Cut 10, you wanna think about getting something like DaVinci Resolve um, to, to go ahead and do this, but especially because you don't have to sign up to Premiere Pro, you don't have to take a Creative Cloud license out, which is you know just for Premiere Pro, uh, or just for After Effects, I think it's about $18 a month. Um, and for, for a full CC license, you need about $50 a month. And it's a lot a lot of money. Final Cut doesn't isn't really an option. DaVinci Resolve is free. So it's a fantastic uh, way of, of, of working because it's not gonna cost you anything to get started. You're gonna need a fairly well-spec system, but um, to really get the most out of it. But even if you don't, there's a fantastic way within Resolve to actually make sure your media is playing back at a usable manner so that you can actually work with it really uh, quickly. So let's fire up DaVinci Resolve and we'll just have a quick run through. A lot of people get particularly concerned with DaVinci Resolve um, that they've never used it. Is it gonna be complicated? And I think I, I really don't know a lot about DaVinci Resolve. I'll say that straight up, but the latest two releases, 12 and 12.5, I found to be incredibly easy to understand and get your head around. And there's so much information poking around online, uh, it, you, it wouldn't take you long to kind of get up and running and understand kind of where, where you are with things. Um, but we'll talk you through the interface very quick and then we'll go through the, the, the workflow and you'll see how quick this is. Um, first of all, DaVinci Resolve fires up your project manager. Once you've got your project manager up, and this is basically where you manage all of your projects within DaVinci Resolve. DaVinci Resolve doesn't quite work like other NLEs where you actually have a project file um, that stores away on your hard drive. It works under databases, so it's a little bit different. And you'll see if you come to the top right, click here, go to database, you'll see there's some databases here. Now, this top one here is one that I've made and I've chosen where I want to put it. So it's on a fast edit drive over here. Resolve, where is it? There it is, databases, 2016, resolve projects, settings, users. And you can see in here, you've got all this information. Okay and you can see cache files go in here as well. So that's basically where everything gets stored in, in there. And the default is the local database and it just puts it on your main boot drive, which is absolutely fine, but you just need to be wary that it, that's where it is. Sometimes it's in a place which is a little bit tricky to get to, at least this way you know where everything is. And for me, I'm doing it yearly, so 2016, uh, is gonna be where I'm gonna have all my projects from 2016. They're gonna go in that database. And the good thing actually is if you look at the database itself, so let's maybe look at that. You know, it's not a huge file size. So we're pretty good so far. Where that changes slightly is when you start optimizing media. So I'll come back to that in a minute, but just know it's based around databases. You can restore, backup, connect. You can, it's all designed as well, so you can work over networks as well if you really wanted to. So. That's that, and that's how that sort of base basically sets up. Every time you fire up DaVinci Resolve, it's gonna offer you a new untitled project waiting ready for you. Obviously, you can go back to old ones that you've been to before. We're gonna start up a new one. So to do that, simply right click and rename. Best to rename it first. I'm gonna go for X5R Workflow, and I'm gonna hit OK. And that's gonna change the name. Double click, and we're gonna enter it, and into, we're into the project interface. So. With Resolve, this is how it all sets out. This is how it will look when you first fire it up. Main four things to know about Resolve are these four tabs down here. Media, Edit, Color, and Deliver, okay? So for those of you who are a little bit concerned or don't know what to do, where do we start with Resolve? It's very, very straightforward. If you float around, you've got tool tips, so it starts telling you where things should be. But for those of you who've worked in Premiere or maybe Final Cut 7, uh, even Final Cut 10 to a degree, you're gonna start recognizing things within the interface that you're gonna, you're gonna appreciate. 